So in this lecture, we shall start talking about iron and steel and the fun things you can do with them. So iron is, uh, as I said before, one of the most common uh, elements in the earth, the most in the entire earth, one of the most common in the earth's crust which is where we do most of our business as humans. Um, fourth in abundance. Uh, the hardness in the Mohs scale of four is quite hard. But if we look at these other scales of hardness, you can see there's a, there's a range. And so it isn't necessarily always true that iron is always harder than copper, it seems. Um, the melting temperature is somewhat problematic as it's not commonly uh, easily reachable as a temperature in the Middle East up until uh, moderately recent times. Um, but we'll get to that later. So iron had to be processed in its particular way. Being so common, however, uh, once they worked out how to use it, it was used everywhere. And these are just types of spades. Um, we tend not to have bronze spades from the Bronze Age, which are quite so common. Um, bronze was for more important things. Here, some uh, digging a hole with a spade. Here are some more spades from a museum, in, an agricultural museum in Syria I went to. It's very nice. Uh, here are people working with hoes. Here's a plow. It's actually an ard. It's just a pointy thing. This is more like a plow. So this is uh, when you get plows. And these are also uh, ards, uh, not really plows because they don't have a turning board. Um, but they look very interesting, sort of like delta wing bombers or something, also in this agricultural museum. Uh, in Syria I went to, which was like, strange in many ways. So meteoric iron isn't like native copper or native gold and things like that. Um, native copper artifacts, we probably uh, do not find too much more native copper unless one you know, goes to very new different areas. But if you're staying in the Middle East, of course, uh, most of the native copper were being found and used a very long time ago. Uh, meteoric iron can still come down every so often. Uh, so it's something that, that does sort of replenish. So the Hittites thought all iron came from heaven. Uh, they thought stone is from the earth, copper came from Cyprus, and iron is from heaven. Uh, so uh, whether that means up, upwards uh, from the stars or not, I wouldn't like to vouch for it, but it's, uh, it's interesting they thought it came from up there somewhere. So meteoric iron will have a high nickel content, and we do find objects uh, recently uh, these were found to uh, be meteoric, meteoritic iron 5,000 years ago from Egypt, high little iron beads. So it does crop up once in a while. To actually make iron, you go through a smelt, as I showed you uh, last time. But also, as I said last time, the metal at the bottom here may not be something you just pick up and make things with. In the case of iron, it's not really solid metal it's what we call a bloom um, which is a funny thing to call an ugly brown lump um, it's not like a pretty flower but that's called a bloom and so what you do with the bloom is you take it out and you hit it with a big hammer repeatedly uh, and so you heat it up and you hit it and here we have this chap i can't say this is a bloom but it's basically the technique he's got uh, pliers He's got a source of heat here. There's this chap with bellows making it very hot indeed. He puts it in, takes it out. This chap hits it with a hammer a lot. And that will eventually turn the bloom into a piece of metal, which you can make something out of. So the earliest smelted iron seems uh, to date from about 3rd millennium BC in eastern Anatolia, according to texts and some archaeology. By the late second millennium BC, it seems to have spread to the rest of the world, at least to the rest of uh, the, the Middle East. 
Um, took some while to get to some parts of the world. From about the second millennium BC, it seems to be mostly steel. Uh, seems to start getting steel in Levant and Cyprus. Although this is actually from the 14th century BC, so this is towards the end of the second millennium BC. And it's from Western Iran, uh, although it's currently in the ROM. And this has actually been radiocarbon dated. You see someone drilled a hole in it. And since, of course, it has carbon in it, being steel, it actually um, can be radiocarbon dated. And so it was radiocarbon dated in the 14th century BC. And as you can see, it's a, it's a very nice thing. It had quite a high uh, carbon content. And it is a steel artifact from the 14th century BC. So at some time, uh, we stopped being in a Bronze Age and went into an Iron Age. And that seemed to be about uh, on this very nice uh, timeline here, about 1200 BC or so. Um, this, uh, how this happened is debatable, and I do love a good debate, but it's very likely that most people are wrong, because people tend to be. Um, as I've said before, most metal artifacts don't exist anymore, and it's very difficult to actually study some of these things properly. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions, like iron, steel is better than bronze, which it isn't necessarily, but I'm sure it's a lot cheaper to produce. Uh, so what happened in about 1200 BC is this was actually a time of great unrest. There was a lot of invasions and people going around burning down cities and all this sort of thing. Uh, very, very unpleasant time to be around. Uh, not very nice. And so some people have attributed this to people with iron. That you would have people with iron. And of course, if you have iron and you're using iron, you can equip a lot more people with weapons than you could if you're using bronze because it's more abundant uh, once you work out how to use it. So this is an advantage of iron over bronze is that you can make more of it because it's more easily available. Um, and so it's possible that all these people rampaging around burning cities down and all this sort of thing had iron and were enabled to uh, equip more people. Other people, uh, uh, other not other people at the time, other people now, other archaeologists and other people looking at this issue, uh, have suggested that what happened was that happened anyway. And what, what all these people running around burning down cities and generally being unpleasant did was lead to uh, an interruption in the trade of copper and tin. As you may have got, uh, gotten from the uh, lecture on copper and uh, bronze, these things tended to come from a long way away, and you needed uh, a well-developed trade network and a, and a typically a well-controlled trade network in order to bring in all these metals from far away. Um, and so what happened as a result of this disruption of trade, uh, people started relying more on, on iron, and, and that's why you get an Iron Age. So, you know, could be one or the other. Or a bit of both. So iron with carbon is steel. Uh, so that dagger I just showed you is made of steel. Uh, by the 8th century BC most of the things that we call iron are actually steel. And so most everyday objects are actually made of steel um, apparently. And um, so that means what we call the Iron Age was actually mostly the Steel Age. Uh, so the early Bronze Age was actually the uh, uh, Copper Arsenic Alloy Age, and the Iron Age is actually the Steel Age. So steel is typically less than 1% carbon, but always less than 2% carbon. And the typical methods of incorporating the carbon uh, are through solid state absorption of carbon in a closed atmosphere, uh, typically. So how this appears is on the right. These, uh, you've seen thin sections, of course, before, because I keep inflicting them on you. This is a polished section of metals. Um, and so it looks very similar. I and mean, this could be a thin section of a rock with crystals in it. And that is basically what it is. Although these aren't actual minerals, because they're in a sword or something. 
And so you will have crystals of ferrite, iron oxide, and you will have cementite, which is the iron carbide, iron and carbon together. And what, so here the dark will be the iron carbide and the lighter gray is the ferrite. And you will have textures created by the intergrowth of these two crystalline states. You'll have perlite, which is lamellae of ferrite and cementite, which is what we're looking at here, you see. Martensite is formed by quenching from high temperatures. So that's what this is, and that's a high magnification image. However, it's uh, a bit uh, into the Iron Age and or the Steel Age, they, they did work out how to make crucible steel. Uh, this is often called Wurtz uh, because it seems to have been invented in India, and that's what they called it. So this creates layers of ferret and cementite when properly cooled. And we first uh, have evidence of it in texts from the first century AD, including Pliny and also archaeology. By the third century, it's recorded as being in, in being made in Alexandria. So what you do is you take iron and organic materials like wood leaves, fruit and skins, things like that, which are like the, uh, uh, the source of carbon, and you put it in a seal crucible like this one. Um, you heat it to about 1400 degrees centigrade. So everything gets like molten. Uh, but the crucibles need to be highly refractory. They need to um, stand, withstand heat because 1400 degrees centigrade is very, very high, and that's higher than porcelain firing temperature. So a lot of pottery, ordinary pottery, would actually just melt uh, under that temperature. So that this has to be a clay which will not just melt when you heat it up to very high uh, temperatures. Um, in recent examples, they used ordinary clay, but tempered it with very large quantities of rice husks. That's how they were doing it in India. By the 6th century AD, we seem to be getting pattern swords uh, made of these patterns of, uh, of the different types of steel in the blade, which you can reveal if you um, reveal it by uh, polishing it and uh, etching it. So uh, here he is again, waving his sword around. So hang on, let him, let him, let's, let's let him wave, wave his sword around. That's what we need to do. Okay, he's not going to wave his sword around. Never mind. So that's uh, that's steel. So what would be uh, interesting is uh, talking about how you use steel in a very important artifact in the human history which is weapons. Uh, this, this man is not a soldier. He, there was uh, no soldiers in the ancient world up until a certain date, or a prehistoric world actually. When you get into the ancient world, you start getting soldiers. This prehistoric gentleman, you know him well, he's Utzi uh, from the uh, Swiss-Italian border. He's probably actually Italian. Um, <clears throat> he was actually shot in the back by an arrow. That's why he died. Uh, so he was engaged in unpleasantness, but this is before the era of, of um, organized warfare. And so all of his uh, equipment is that of uh, someone just trying to live their life for hunting and um, general doing stuff. Um, you can see he's got his bow here, a wooden bow. Here is a knife or dagger, you might want to call it. And this is uh, a drawing of the actual thing. It's broken at the tip, but you see, perfectly acceptable. These are the arrows that go with the bow. And he also had an axe. So an axe, you might think, oh, well, that's of caving people's heads in. Well, actually, that's how he would have made the bow, you see. Um, that would have been how it was roughly made. And then it probably would have been trimmed with something like this, a, a scraper. And so this is uh, an important part of how you acquire the raw materials you need in order to uh, to live. And so if you actually watch those videos I've suggested you watching, it'd be interesting to see how you make all these things and how an axe is very useful for it. However, you can indeed use it for pit hitting people over the head. But as 
a group of uh, tools, this is not very different from the Paleolithic. Uh, a, a hand axe is really no more, um, well, no less useful, shall we say, than, than a knife in many ways, or a bronze axe. Um, this is probably going to work better under many circumstances, uh, but it's basically the same thing. So, I quite like Gilgamesh. It's a good story. Um, Gilgamesh himself, king of Uruk, if he existed, uh, would have been living about 2900 or 2500 BC in Uruk in southern Iraq. His epic was codified in about 1600 to 1155 BC, um, but it probably would have been a narrative poem that lasted all those years, or, or certainly many of those years. But what's interesting about it is it describes how he attacks people. So he raised his axe in his hand, drew the dagger from his sheath, and fell into their midst like an arrow. He struck and he scattered them. So if you look at how they're describing this great warrior hero, Gilgamesh, they're describing exactly the same sort of thing that Utsi had, that most people would have had in the pre-civilized, uh, shall we say, great civilizations past. Um, hunter and gatherers would have this sort of thing. The image behind is, is from the victory steel of Naram Sin, uh, about 2254 to 2218 BC. And he's Akkadian, great war leader, found an Akkadian empire of sorts. And you can see, and it may be he's actually being depicted in a way people describe Gilgamesh, but maybe this is in fact what he went into war with. And you can see what he's carrying is a bow and an axe. Um, he's otherwise not wearing very many clothes at all. He's just got like a loincloth going on here. And so he's actually equipped pretty much the same way as Gilgamesh or Utsi or any other people. He's engaging in what appears to be organized warfare. Doesn't seem to be especially organized, but uh, it probably is somewhat organized. They can at least afford helmets. He has a horned helmet, of course, because he's very important. On the uh, steel of Naramsin, we have another weapon, a spear. Now, of course, a spear is basically uh, a, a knife or dagger on a stick, so you can poke at things from a greater distance. So again, this is originally a hunting tool, and we have spears actually going back to about 400,000 BP. Uh, these are wooden spears from Germany. Uh, they have fire hardened tips. So, yeah, they're spears. Um, a recent study, 2012 is moderately recent, of uh, these heads, these projectile points, you might say, uh, from uh, South Africa. Uh, one of the authors is actually Michael Chazen of the U of T, because uh, he's from South Africa. And so they looked at these 500,000 year old stone points and felt that the way the, uh, the, the butts here had been finished was appropriate for uh, hafting onto a spear and uh, looking at the brakes would be appropriate for someone thrusting it into something. And so they think, and it's pretty reasonable to me, that these are in fact spears, spear points actually, or spearheads. So spears again are a very old thing. It's not designed for warfare, it's designed for hunting. So that's, I wonder what these things are. <clears throat> these are often thought, said to be the earliest swords in the world. Uh, they're from uh, what is now Turkey, Arslan Tepe, early Bronze Age. They're copper arsenic alloy, and I wonder what they actually are because they don't actually look like swords insofar as Simplistically, they look like they have pointy parts with edgy bits, but this really doesn't look like a comfortable thing to hold on to when you're waving this bit around. So I, I would really like uh, someone to do where you studies on this. I'd like to see someone pick it up, wave it around, hit things with it, see how well it works as a sword, because they are actually something of an anomaly in what is really a story of spears and shields eventually and bows and arrows. 
that's how people were fighting for thousands of years once they actually uh, even before they got organized but once they did get organized still it was a spear and shield and bows and arrows thing here we have possibly the first evidence for organized warfare the so-called standard of ore about 2600 BC and you can see these chaps are very organized they're all wearing the same thing they seem to have what what is a very heavy cloak maybe with studs in or something uh, they all have helmets rather like the Akkadian ones we were just looking at and they all have spears so this is you know if you're going to to fight someone the best way of doing it is poking them from some distance with a spear rather than getting up close and sticking uh, a knife in them and so that's exactly what they're doing here they're all organized together presumably these are these cloaks they look quite heavy maybe made of hide or something and of course since we've covered uh, leather we, you will know that these hides are probably very hard uh, not like a leather cloak or something there's something that could actually turn somebody else's weapon I can maybe remember these chariots as well this is a bit later and shows that they become even more organized they still have the same spears and they have the same helmets it seems but now they have shields and shields are possibly the first actual invention designed specifically for warfare because it doesn't seem to have any other purpose other than stopping people poking other people with their pointy things uh, with their spears and, and and daggers and things and so here you can see these people in what in roman times would be called a phalanx and they're all hiding behind the shields they're poking the spears out very good way of of fighting if you're actually not a hero like gilgamesh you can hide there behind there with your friends and poke uh, your the other guys with uh the spears and of course the other guys end up uh on the ground and strangely naked all the time i don't know why they always get naked so quick um the shield uh there's, there's actually this series of anglo-saxon poems uh from about the ninth century i think called the maxims and they talk about weapons and they they say the shield is for the warrior because only a warrior uses a shield and anyone can use a spear for hunting or i don't know clearing the gutters if they want to um daggers are for all sorts of things uh for cutting up a hide or cleaning your nails all sorts of things you might want to use a dagger for but a, a shield um, unless you want to like surf on it or something it tends to be for defense in warfare and so spears and shields become the main form of warfare other than archery uh, for some time um, this is the tomb of Masetti who I've shown you before with his co very cool uh, shields made of uh, leather this is uh from a mycenaean vase and here again you can see these greek chaps with their shields and their spills their spears and what may be their lunch hanging off of the uh their spear um but you do start to occasionally get people thinking i i'd really like to make a big deal of my dagger um one of these are the scythians remember the scythians uh in uh up particularly in the ukraine and up on the steppe up that sort of area and they would go around running around shooting the people from their horses horse you see they're bringing a horse this is actually to the uh persepolis so these are all offerings to the achaemenid ruler here's an achaemenid learn uh, leading their leader by the hand here come and meet the uh the achaemenid ruler and he's got a bow case here because bows are big well actually no scythian bows are quite small but it's, they are they're very big with them and another thing the scythians had were these uh very long for daggers daggers and they're often called an akanakis and so you can see that they have this projection on one side and you tie it and hang it around your waist and you would have this to uh pull out and uh, use on somebody you didn't like so this is something other people picked up this is actually a median uh a, a persian 
uh, who who has one, and he's bringing it as an offering. And so these became quite popular because, because Scythian warfare was quite popular at the time. But most of the warfare done by the Achaemenids was still uh, based on spears and shields, and also bows. See, he has more bow cases, and this guy has a bow over his shoulder and a quiver. So that's how civilized people conducted warfare. Uh, in Greece, they were called hoplites, and this is the main form of warfare amongst the Greeks as well. Um, spears and, and uh, shields and things. Uh, the, the Greeks did have swords, which they may have picked up from some of their neighbors. This guy has one, you see. They're not common, though. I mean, mostly you see people just using spears and shields. And of course, we've seen this lady before. She has tattoos. She's probably a, a, a Scythian or a relative of the Scythians and uh, influenced by their culture. Another weapon that seemed to be used in Greece at the time is the is this single edge sword uh, called Verus Copis or a Falcata or Makira, depending where you are. Also in Spain, uh, very popular there. And here you see this guy is using one, and this guy is using one, and this guy is clearly not Greek. He may be a Persian or something. But it's actually. Uh, the Celts that seem to be very big on big swords. Uh, they had big swords in the Bronze Age, but these are uh, swords of the Latin period. And uh, the Iron Age in um, Europe starts off supposedly at sites like Hallstatt, the, the, the site that the early Iron Age cultures are named after in Europe. Uh, as you can see, Hallstatt, and in fact where most of the Hallstatt culture comes from, is up in the mountains. This is in Austria, in narrow valleys. And uh, the Hallstatt culture and the Latin culture are supposed to be the origins of Celtic peoples, uh, which occupied a lot of Western Europe, and they're still there to this day, according to uh, DNA. Um, and it was thought at one stage that the Celts were came from this part of the world and then invaded the rest of, of Europe. And I, because I've actually been to this part of the world, I used to go skiing here when I was a teenager. And when I heard, yes, all Celts come from here, I thought that was total bollocks. I mean, that's probably unlikely because it's not the sort of place where you can imagine large surpluses of population being developed, which then had to go and conquer Europe. Um, and it seems that uh, DNA is supporting that. So Hallstatt um, is the center of this culture, um, starting in the Bronze Age and then into the Iron Age. Um, and then it spreads across Europe. And uh, eventually it uh, becomes the Latin culture and spreads over even more of Europe. And so it's quite widespread, but it looks like what must have happened was the idea of uh, Latin uh, spread around the material culture, the pottery, because the Celts have always been over here. Uh, this uh, uh, Y-DNA group seem to be specific to this part of the world and have been uh, since the Bronze Age. And so the Celts would have been there before and picked up swords. In fact, they had swords uh, in the Bronze Age as well. They seem very keen on swords. It's a very sword-oriented culture. Um, and of course, they spread. They spread all over this area, and they also spread into Italy, where we get one of the first recordings of what the Celts were like when they came charging into your uh, home with swords. And this was the Battle of the Alia. The Alia is uh, a tributary of the Tiber, uh, one of the, uh, the, the the river that Rome is built on. And so the, this group of Celts defeated the Roman army and burnt down Rome. And they were very lucky to be able, able to survive. <clears throat> so a contemporary account describes them a bit later. 
in 225 uh, BC, they would raise their swords aloft and smite after the manner of wild boars, throwing the whole weight of their bodies into the blow like hewers of wood, as if they intended to cut to pieces the entire bodies of their adversaries, armour and all. And also a lot of them were running around in the nuddy as well, which thankfully this artist is not showing much of. So it's kind of like scary, big naked men with big swords hacking away. And so, of course, what the Romans after this decided they wanted was swords. Where they ended up getting swords was, in fact, Spain. Uh, this is, is a, a recent uh, site, in fact, just published this year. Uh, it's 2020 when I'm recording this, if this is still visible in 2021. Um, <clears throat> uh, from northern Spain, uh, where some of these uh, Celtic peoples were, and it's uh, the site of a massacre. And here you can see uh, the effect of these large, long swords on the human body. Uh, this chap has had his head taken off. Celts like to collect heads. And here you can see there's no like hacking and whacking. One good sweep and that head has gone. This individual with bangles on try to lift their, this as their forearm to protect themselves from one of these sword waving people and the arm was cut clean off. I did warn you there's going to be human remains in this one, so don't give me a hard time. So that the Romans uh, were in this part of the world uh, because they were fighting the, uh, the Punic people, uh, the Carthaginians, uh, those descendants of Phoenicia who had uh, also gone to uh, Spain. A lot of important materials here, of course, copper, for instance, and, and lead and silver. And so the, the Italians had a lot of wars and eventually defeated them and came back from Spain, which they call uh, Hispaniensis, uh, Hispania rather, with a sword, the Hispaniensis, which was quite a long sword. You see, it's longer than some of these later swords. So these are often called gladii or a gladius singular. Um, they're called gladiuses because that's what the Romans called them at the time. Uh, it was a tremendous fun, but that's basically what they called swords. So when they were using these swords, the Romans called swords a gladius. They were called a sword a gladius. So here you can see a few of these Hispaniensis. They were, as you can see, nasty things. Uh, you could do a lot of damage to someone with that sort of thing. And so they picked these up and started waving them around at people like the Greeks. And it has been suggested that one of the reasons that the Romans were quite successful against the Greeks was that the Greeks really didn't like being carved up by swords. Uh, warfare with spears uh, and shields uh, left your corpse looking a lot more attractive. And of course, to the Greeks, they were going into the afterlife and you would look pretty much as you did now. Um, and so if you went into the afterlife, with this small hole where someone had stabbed you with a spear, you'd look pretty good. But if some Roman had hacked you up, you would not look so good in the afterlife, which of course you're gonna be in the afterlife for a long time to the Greeks. So it was a bad thing. And of course I've heard other people saying that's complete nonsense, but I like it. And so some of the later gladii include the Pompeii style. And this is a Pompeii style uh, gladius from Herculaneum near Pompeii because a number of them were found at Pompeii. So his was, was quite long. This, these are all Pompeii style gladii. You see it's quite long. Um, some of the later ones are shorter because they the Romans got very much into uh, this sort of fighting with a big shield and poking at people from behind it, which you've probably seen in, in many uh, amusing reenactments on the television. However, and eventually we're going to get back to the Middle East, I promise you. Uh, remember those Celts running around with their big swords? Another thing the Celts liked to do was ride horses. They actually had a horse goddess and were very keen on horses. They were quite good at it. Um, and the Romans, uh, not so much. And so they recruited quite a lot of Roman auxiliary uh, cavalrymen. Um, 
are from Gaul. And so Gauls like this chap. Um, it's actually, he was found in what is now Germany, but he would have been a, a Gaul uh, from the Trier region. Uh, and uh, as you can see, he has a big sword, a really big sword. This isn't some little pokey thing. This is a good cavalryman's whacking sword. Um, and these are often called a spartha, like this, spartha. Um, the thing about the spartha, and so you see this guy is first century AD, okay? Um, and this is probably about the same date. Uh, it's called a spartha because it became more popular. Uh, at first it was a, a cavalry sword, but as the Roman period uh, carried on, uh, this became the main type of sword. And even the infantry were using them too, because basically when it came to it, everybody likes big long swords, as long as is as reasonable. And so this became the main sword of the Roman world, which of course included the Middle East. Um, this one uh, is an early one, uh, an early Spartha. And this one is from the third century and is actually from Syria. And so you can see it's the same kind of thing. This, these parts are all from from Dura Europos, and I have them put together to make a replica of this sword, which is looks like this. And so you can see this is a a Roman sword, and at the uh, in of the third century, and by about this time, uh, what the Romans called a sword was a spartha, and that's what most of the swords looked like was like this. So when people nowadays say, oh yes, that's a, the short ones are called a gladius and the long ones are called a spartha, it's just that the Romans called swords gladii when they had short swords and spartha when they had long swords. And they call swords to this day a sparta. Not just sparta in that Spanish. Anyway, so yeah. So in the Sasanian world, one of the interesting things you can see here is they have a very similar sword. Uh, the sword is long and it's straight. Uh, maybe they, they picked it up from uh, from the Romans who they were fighting and they'd have picked up a lot of good ideas from them. Um, people tended to pick up good ideas from their enemies if they were successful. But what is interesting about the Sasanian swords is that is the grip clearly has a way around. Now a blade, even if... Um, it doesn't have an obvious way round, because uh, you can see clearly the finger goes in here for, for the grip, sort of like a pistol grips um, grip. And so even if it doesn't have like a pistol grip, it has an ordinary grip, uh, people will say that the side here with the finger is the true edge, and the other side is the false edge. And this is very important in sword fighting. And you will use the, the true edge for the actual fighting people. You may use a bit of the back edge occasionally, but typically it's just one side. And here it's very clear that this is the side that they will be cutting at people with. And so this is the important side. And the other side is a lot less important. And it may be that it was quite easy then to turn it into a not sharp edge which is what we then get a bit later on. This is actually from Hungary. These are called Avar uh, sabers, um, but the Avars actually come from Central Asia. So this is probably something we get all over Central Asia at the time. And when the Turks uh, came from Central Asia into the Middle East, they would bring swords just like this. And as you can see, they're, they're, they're long and they're also slightly curved. And uh, so this is the beginning of the curved sword uh, at, at this time. Uh, and eventually, oh, and here's quite a nice one. This is the Saber of Charlemagne, um, which is actually in Vienna at the moment. Um, but it's uh, probably 10th century as well. And uh, it's, it's very nice. You can see it's got this handled, uh, this handle is uh, bent like this to enable the grip better. And the has one sharp edge, and this will eventually lead on to what uh, they call in Iran a shamshir. This is an Iranian one, and often called a scimitar, which is the translation of, of shamshir. And the reason 
that it's curved is because when you're fighting something, so like, so here's my avatar who's taking offense at this mustache. It's a very annoying mustache. And so he's going to do something about it. I, so you can see that the sword, it's not like he goes in and uses the whole sword because he's got a knife. And so when you are fighting with the sword, you try to keep as far away as possible and move in close enough to use the sword and then get out of the way. Um, and so you don't get up very, very close like you're fighting with a dagger and just whack at somebody. You also, if you if you hit someone hard enough, but not to, so hard it goes right through them, shall we say, um, you may get your sword stuck in them. And if he has friends, you need that sword. So you just want swish and you're out. Uh, and so you tend to only use those last couple of centimeters or inches of the point. And so if you have this curve, that means more of the actual edge is exposed to the surface, to the skin of the person you're cutting into as you're slashing down. So it makes it a far more effective cut than a straight sword is. So that's why curved swords develop. But that's also why they only developed in a big way after the end of gunpowder, because this is practically useless against armor. Any kind of armor, chain armor or anything, would turn this quite easily and you'd have to get like a big heavy weapon to hit people with. And so uh, after gunpowder is introduced, uh, this becomes more useful. These are actually the swords of Muhammad. Um, and they're quite nice. Uh, this one is actually, I think, Cairo. I think the rest are in Istanbul. Um, it's interesting to look at them and think, are they really the swords of Muhammad, who, of course, lived like a long time ago? Um, this one looks good. It does actually look very much like a contemporary Byzantine sword. Um, this has quite a good pedigree as well. Um, there are, it has a history uh, of being in Muhammad's property, as is this one, which actually looks a lot to me uh, like a Sasanian sword of about the same time. All of the grips are later, and that happened all the time, um, that this is a weak joint. Also, if it's stuck in your belt, um, you want the, the, the bit sticking out to be pretty and up to date. So they will often change the, the grips, but not the blade. This looks a lot like uh, a Roman Sparza, doesn't it? Uh, it's very wide. It's a big hacking sword. So again, and again, this has quite a good pedigree, uh, as does this one. Uh, this is so-called the, the Dulfikar, which was passed to Ali, um, which probably means that the two uh, grooves in this case, although people later thought the Dulfikar meant that it had two points, which is, of course, highly unlikely. This one also sounds quite respectable. This one has less of a respectable history um, and was apparently used by the Fatimid Khalifs uh, quite a lot, uh, which makes me think it's actually 10th century. And this one, of course, looks even later and really doesn't seem to have a very respectable history at all. And so it's probably even later again. So, but these ones, I think, are quite respectable and have a good likelihood that they are the swords of Mohammed. So that concludes our looking at steel and iron and swords. Thank you.